these are artists who are who are sending out messages in the bottle and receiving messages in the bottle so that we can remember them and be impacted by them, as Jack and Megan were saying. Um, we're so excited to share a couple videos from the Well of Wills Collective. Um, they are individually and collectively constantly, constantly collaborating with Labshul on our forum stage at Shabbat, guest ritual artists. Um, High Holiday, our storyteller from this year, Nessa Nork, is a founding member of, of, of um, Well of Wills. They are a collective of female, female identifying Jewish artists who create socially relevant feminist, community-driven artwork for all faiths and genders. The platform provides community educational resources and a laboratory for women to explore and investigate their spirituality and creative voice. Their interdisciplinary art practices include visual arts, performance, and excitedly, film, which we're going to show a couple of tonight. Um, yeah, Melissa, tell us about this. I was, yeah, I was going to say, well, I mean, I think it's so important as we're talking about these super un unprecedented times that shared process is actually an invitation to invite stories of our resilience, of grief, of joy, of revelation uh, on theme uh, through a series of creative challenges. So participants receive these weekly tutorials teaching filmmaking tools to capture their experiences through microfilms. So these are gonna be short boys. Um, so these short films will be used in a collectively made short uh, about living through the pandemic. So we're going to show a couple of these submissions now, and we'll see you uh, on the other side. Making a decision in the middle of a pandemic. Um, okay, where do you want to be? When should I move back to New York? To New York. Cities are the vectors of disease. Should I move back to New York? I love the quiet. Um, Cities are more dangerous. Are they doomed? <sighs> it's important to live in your family. I hate the quiet. Is suburbia Cities are possible dangerous. without all the plastic? I miss the subway. What is suburbia without shopping Just malls? relax. What? I hate the subway. Be Acknowledge that this isn't a good time for making Seven. decisions. Eight. Acknowledge that this Ten. is not Nine. existential. Twelve. Acknowledge Twelve. your weight. This privilege. kind of loss is not Seven. worthy of people's Seven. attention. 18, 19, 20. 20. 20. There are basically two things I'm interested in. Falling in love and finding God. The God I seek is one whose image is constantly changing, a God I can feel more than I can see, ever present yet elusive, a God who goes by many names. Octavia E. Butler says God is change. Others say God is universe. I can go around the world asking everyone who God is and each person's answer will be different. And yet, don't we all know that feeling? The feeling of awe, the feeling of being lifted, the feeling of falling in love. And I understand now I am actually only interested in one thing, because to find God is to fall in love. This is a supercut of the 35 gloves I saw on a 13 minute walk on March 29th gray glove, clear glove, that kind of purpley blue glove, purpley blue glove, glove, clear glove, purple glove, clear glove, clear glove, purple glove, blue glove, purpley blue glove, blue glove, purple glove, purple glove, blue glove, clear glove, blue gardening glove, blue surgical glove, Clear surgical, surgical glove. glove, white surgical glove, black, white surgical, surgical glove. glove, purple, purple glove. surgical glove, purple surgical glove, light blue, purple surgical, surgical, surgical glove. glove, clear surgical, black glove. surgical glove, light blue surgical glove, clear glove. surgical glove, glove. purple Pink. surgical glove, green surgical glove.
Making a decision in the middle of a pandemic. Um, okay. Like, Where oh, like a week. There, there, there are all these just like short little windows into like the reality of people all across the country and what they're going through in these in these times. It's really incredible work. I'm gonna just say one thing I forgot to say was that I follow them on Instagram and you can too. So you can go to Shared Process on Instagram and you can learn all about this. But while we were gone, Ezra, I heard we got some news. We do have some news. I um, wonder if we could tell the people our news. Yes, an update on our fundraising goal. We asked. I hope the image is ready to be queued. We are at $17,000, $17,000. Our goal for tonight, over these, for today, these 24 hours is 50,000. We are at 17,000, we are on our way. So thank you every single person who donated. By donating, you are putting money into the, into those artists that you just saw. You are putting money into their hands. They put that work out for free. Labtual is stepping up to help make sure that they get paid for the art, for the work, and for the art that they're creating. We're also raising money for the First Responders Children's Fund and the National Day Laborers Organi Organizing Network for Immigrant Worker Safety. Um, so please, please, please donate. Melissa, you've got the info, right? I, 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 I absolutely I've got the info. You can, donate. <laughs> you can donate online. Uh, Labshul, donate. You can Venmo at Labshul. You can hit us up on PayPal, and of course, you can send a check as well. Any dollar and in any way counts and makes a big difference, not only to Labshul, not only to the 150 people that have been pouring themselves into making today, tonight, and today possible, um, but also to those incredible uh, organizations that really need your support and helping support so many people in need during COVID. So here's what I'm hearing, that we started at 7.30 and it is now 10.09 and that we have $33,000 left to raise. So I just wanna say that to all of you folks at home that we're excited to meet our, our, our mark tonight and thank you for being part of that. Ezra, let's move on to our next uh, act. Yes, can't wait. Um, so our next act is their masks are off, how the COVID crisis has revealed old threats and new possibilities. You want to tell us about uh, who's leading it? Yeah, I'm so excited. This is amazing. It's almost like we have, uh, you know, just like a celebrity with us. Uh, Stosh uh, Kotler brings more than 30 years of experience as an organizer a trainer and a leader in movements for justice and equity and is a nationally recognized leader for, of the movements to renew and expand the Jewish community's role in progressive social change in the US. Um, and in her nearly 15 years of leadership at Ben the Ark, Stosh has overseen many of the organization's most successful national growth strategies. So I'm so excited now to have Stosh is part of our lab school community and is part of our event here tonight. So we'll take it away uh, to Stosh. Hey Marika, we're just gonna make sure that the rolling. Oh, okay. No should, problem. Should we continue to talk to the folks? Um, I'd love to, yeah, I'd love to hear more from you, Melissa. Too. Yeah, well, I mean, one of the things that I just want to say, and I think that everybody who's at home right now um, on Zoom has been with us on Zoom constantly, and even before quarantine or physical distancing or any of the things that have happened since, uh, I think, March 9th, I'm going to tell you something. My last Lab Shul in-person event was your Purim event. And I know we're gonna be seeing a little bit of what, you know, Ezra's magic is later, spoiler alert. Um, but I just wanna say that being able to be in the playful community and the playful spaces of Lab Shul has been part of what has made me feel like a Jew. I mean, I came to my Judaism really, really late. I was someone who didn't know the first thing. 
And it wasn't until I met the folks at Lapshul that I understood that I had a home, that I had a place to be an artist and an adventurer and experimental and to learn how to dig into my roots and how to ask big questions. And so every year that I continue to come back in whatever capacity I come back, whether it's in the, um, in the room during high holidays or if I'm working with my RTB kids for Justice Club, which is why I was so excited to introduce Stosh is that social justice is something that's really near and dear to my heart. And Labshul has partnered with organizations all throughout the city for years now, whether it's the Muslim Community Network, we were just all at an iftar together um, and hearing all of the voices um, of having different communities come together in a spiritual space. We do that. We work with um, the New Sanctuary Coalition. Uh, so the idea that we're donating money to um, immigrants' rights and understanding that um, so much is in peril and that lab shuls be, I mean, I'm speaking totally legit, like just the fact that lab shul is taking the money that's coming into us tonight that we need for all of our programming and saying that it's important for us to give that money to groups that need it is why I keep coming back. Uh, so I'm excited to be connected. Thank you, Queen Marika, keeping us rolling with, um, with all of the crazy tech that this has required. We really invented a whole new technology just to make this night possible. So thank you, Marika, for all the work that you're doing. And we'll hand it over to the brilliant, brilliant Stash and Amichai. Thank you, friends. Thank you. Stash, my dear, dear sister, hello to you. I'm loving you for my backyard into your home, uh, sheltering in peace. Um, I know we're going to show you a video, uh, the Ben Diak video, at the end of the segment at the beginning. Thank you for that flexibility. Mm -hmm. um, so, my sister, we've been friends for a long time. It's been such an honor to have you and your family with us so often, not only at worship, but at protests and working together for justice. On this night in America, we're here on the screen, and we know that around us there is so much turmoil. I just saw a glimpse that uh, there's curfews now being um, in LA and in Minneapolis uh, for fear of what's going on. So I turn to you as a dauntless leader and a um, someone who's coming to this as a human being and as a Jew and as a woman and as a leader and so many hats really invite you to share with us what's the amazing revelation that you and Ben the Ark in the last recent months and years have uncovered and want us to know about, about the role of white supremacy, white nationalism, othering and so forms, and how we need to know and what we need to know. So thank you for leading us. Thank Always you. and tonight. Oh my gosh. I mean, hi. You know how much I love you, like this, this, this big. And I'm so grateful to be part of the Lab Shul community. And I'm uh, at one point, I was interested in getting member, so to this can be the most perfect uh, way to jump right in. And, I um, and also a really auspicious cool. time to be having this conversation tonight about what the impacts of white supremacy and white nationalism and racism are revealing to some of us and particularly to some of us who are white and what white supremacy, white nationalism has been known to so many people. And I wanna say in particular black people who um, right now I just wanna name the violence that is happening and moving across our country that has been part of the black experience since this country's inception. And this conversation I hope brings some understanding and comfort to know that um, there are many of us who are going to do everything it takes for as long as it takes to be with you in this fight to dismantle racism. So the video that we were going to see, well, first let me just jump back and say, I couldn't hear the introduction. So I am not only a member of Lapshul, but I'm also the CEO of Ben the Ark, our C3 and our C4 Ben the Ark Jewish Action. And Ben the Ark is a national Jewish organization. We're a home for 
Jews across the country who want to express their Jewish values and Jewish allies who want to express values that are about transforming this country. And we believe that transformation is not only possible, but is actually part of our sacred obligation as Jews to do that work. And the video that we were going to see that you'll see at the end of this is a video from our most recent campaign that we launched just a few months ago. And that campaign is called We Rise as One. And our latest campaign is part of a multi-year effort that Ben the Ark has been working on with frontline communities, communities that are also targeted in the crosshairs of this violence that is being perpetuated by white nationalists. And this is an effort not only to push back white nationalism, but ultimately to bring forward and to bring into reality and into being the multiracial democracy that this country has never seen. So it's not just a defensive fight. It's actually a very proactive and offensive reaching and yearning for what is possible here in this country if we can work in solidarity and build the political will to become the future that all of us so desperately need. So tonight I'm going to be spending time talking about the dangers of white nationalism and particularly in the context of this pandemic. And it's, you know, it is maybe an overly rich context to think more about what is being revealed, to whom it is being revealed, and what we can do right now to take care of one another and to make sure that we are really harnessing the profound opportunity that is in front of us to recalibrate power in a way that is in service to justice and equity for all people. So there's a little context here about the campaign and about this uh, conversation around white nationalism. And Ben the Ark has been working on these issues now for many years. We started in 2015 when then candidate Donald Trump announced his run for office with the incredibly offensive, racist, false uh, assertion that Mexicans are rapists and murderers, totally atrocious and needing to be condemned immediately. He then on, went on, of course, to talk about creating a Muslim registry to not at all uh, denouncing David Duke. And there was cause to be alarm, which we were. And we have seen thus far that that alarm was um, absolutely merited. And what we began to see over time, of course, is that there were moments crystal clear where the demonization of immigrants, the, the attack on the free press, the incitement to mob violence, there were things that were happening early in 2015 and 2016 that led many of us who are Jews to feel this sense of recognition and dread in our bones. And that's why the campaign that we launched in 2016 was called We've Seen This Before. And it's a campaign that sadly we lost. We lost that fight along with so many others who were fighting. I'm not talking right now about a fight against a particular person or a political party. I'm talking about a fight against what I'll just broadly call Trumpism that existed long before this current administration and that has been part of the fabric of this very country. And right now, we know that while we fought that fight in 2016 and lost, what we also knew is that the day after the election, we put a letter out to the American Jewish community where 45,000 American Jews signed on and pledged to fight for as long as it took in order to be by the sides of those who we knew would be targeted by this administration. And we've been doing that work day after day since that time, and that's the work that we continue to do. And so now at this time, one might ask, why is it so important to focus on fighting white nationalism? Out of all the issues that are confronting us, why are we focusing on white nationalism and the politicians and the public leaders that enable it, either through active participation or by silence. And the response that we give to that is that we believe that white nationalism is the single biggest danger to our democracy in the United States. And we also believe that it is the single greatest danger to the Jewish community and also to other communities who have been targeted long before this administration, but the combination of factors we believe is a threat to all of us right now. 
And before I say anything more about this, I just want to make a distinction between white supremacy and white nationalism, because sometimes we end up using these concepts interchangeably, consciously or not, they get substituted for one another. And there's absolutely a relationship between them. And in some cases, the Venn diagram is so overlapping that they appear to be one and the same. But it's important, I think, that we think about them because they actually came about and formed for different reasons and in different points in time. And the way we are going about combating and fighting back these different uh, manifestations, both of horrific racism and anti-Semitism and other forms of bigotry are a little bit different. So knowing that there are courses on this topic, books on this topic, I'm going to say just a few words that white supremacy, when I think about white supremacy, I think about a meta system, a political, social, and economic political, uh, a political, social, and economic hierarchy, if you will, that ensures that white people, and in the context of the United States, it's white Christian people, maintain power and control and are the recipients of the benefits of being at the top of that hierarchy. And that this hierarchy contains laws, policies, cultural norms, and it aggregates and it builds over time so that generation after generation after generation, those that are on top, get more and more powerful, those that are below and at the very bottom become more and more disinvested in and are impacted in the most severe ways over and over again. White supremacy has been part of the fabric of this country's origin from the genocide of Native American peoples to the enslavement of Black people, the basis of our economy. And the system of white supremacy is one that I would describe, and this is important, I would describe it as impersonal, meaning that it is not reliant on individual people anymore to hold actively racist, blatantly racist views in order for white supremacy to continue and to flourish. There's, an in, there's a momentum that has already become generating, that is already generating and reinforcing simply because it exists right now. That, however, doesn't mean that individual people don't have a role to play. We absolutely do. And if we don't play it, white supremacy will continue. But white supremacy is a phenomenon that exists without people actively perpetuating it in the ways that we often think about white supremacists. I want to contrast that really quickly with white nationalism. White nationalism came out of white supremacy. It came out of the loss that white people faced at the end of the civil rights movement. And white, white nationalists could not fathom that they actually lost the civil rights movement to black people. They couldn't believe that black people were intelligent, brilliant, organized, strat st strategic enough to actually win their own freedoms. And so white nationalists, number one, blamed Jews and made up the conspiracy that it was Jews who were behind the civil rights movement, which is totally offensive to the brilliance of black people. And it also really reinforced stereotypes and tropes that had been around about Jews and power and control for a very, very long time. So when we think about white nationalism, we're actually thinking about a forward looking movement, a movement that understands that white supremacy is nostalgic, that it was at a time when white people were going to be and were in the numeric majority. And white nationalists, on the other hand, see very clearly that white people are moving forward and will be a demographic minority very soon. And instead of just controlling people of color and Jews and others, their design is to actually um, create ethnic cleansing, to remove all of us from this country. There's an inherent violence in white nationalism that's also present in white supremacy, but it is of a different nature. It's a movement, not a system. And therefore we have to fight it as we're fighting a political movement, not just a system. And when I talk about this stuff, sometimes I feel like I'm being so hyperbolic. Like there is a movement right now where we have representation in every elected office up to the presidency 
who ascribe to some degree or another of a white nationalist political agenda. That sounds almost impossible to think is happening right now, but in fact, it's true. And it's important to remember that at one point in time, not that long ago, white nationalism as a movement and white nationalists as individuals were very, very much at the fringe of our society in the United States and now have moved very, very firmly into the mainstream. So in this moment in time where we're seeing uprisings in the streets all across this country because of the ongoing murder of black people at the hands of the police and others, and as we're reeling as a country from a pandemic that has disproportionately impacted black and brown communities, and as we're seeing this rise in white nationalism and this move towards authoritarianism globally, as well as here, it truly is the perfect storm. And early on in the pandemic days, I began to think about the pandemic as a storm, as a tsunami, actually. That's the image that kept coming to my mind. And at first I was thinking about it as a tsunami in the way that there was this very eerie quiet that was happening and it was the quiet that emergency room doctors like my partner were seeing where there were no people in the emergency room, but everyone knew that the disaster was imminent. And then the image of the tsunami became even more appropriate when we heard and saw that as a tsunami moves, it pulls all of the water from the ocean out, sometimes miles. And what was just right underneath the surface of the water becomes exposed. And what we saw in our own system here in the United States, and what some of us knew all along, but what many others woke up to, was a healthcare system that was designed for profit and not care. Historic levels of wealth inequality and economic insecurity, personal debt and homelessness. We saw corruption and profiteering at the highest levels of our democratic institutions, as well as the list goes on and on and on. And so, Part of what we have been learning at Bend the Arc is how to respond to this moment of overwhelm and magnitude. And what I'll say very simply is that there is an incredible need to continue to fight racism and in particular anti-black racism at this moment. That that is showing up in the pandemic, it's showing up in white nationalism and it's showing up visibly all across the country. And I would say to all of us who are white, we have essential roles to play in that fight. And if folks are interested in having that conversation after tonight, then we at Bend the Arc would love to be in that conversation with you. And I wanna name that Bend the Arc is a multiracial organization and sees the multiracialness of our beautiful Jewish community. And that part of our work is to un racism for the sake of Jews of color being able to thrive and live in our own Jewish community, and also because it is a moral, moral and ethical imperative for us to be fighting that fight. We also have seen how in the short amount of time the political right has morphed very quickly and has moved to create new scapegoats. Jews are still being blamed now for the pandemic. Chinese people are being blamed for the pandemic. Asian Americans are being blamed for the pandemic. This is another way that the political right is using this crisis to distract us and to turn our attention anywhere, but towards their own desire to continue to violently create a country that is only for them and not for others. And it's a way for this administration to deflect and distract from the massive incompetence and their own complicitness in a highly preventable plague that has ravaged this country in very uneven ways. And then finally, we are seeing that the different and disparate parts of the political right, the conspiracy theorists, the militia movement, the anti-vaxxers, all of them are seeing that this is a moment they're trying to seize. And part of our work, I believe, is to, to understand that in the moment that they see as their greatest opportunity is simultaneously for us, the moment where never before in my lifetime have I seen the possibility for the level of transformation that we can create if we figure out how to organize ourselves ourselves well. So I know my time is wrapping up and I'll say just a few things. One, 
Wait, is my time wrapping up? I think my time is wrapping up. You have, you have about a minute because we want to show the video at the end. I have a thousand ah. questions, but I know we will continue. Okay. But, um, so one of the things that I will say is that we have seen now in real time, in the time of this pandemic, we have seen the kind of transformation that we, many of us, have been told our entire lives either not be possible ever or would take decades and generations to change. I have to tell you all that even though I lead an organization, I am quite a pessimistic public leader. Those that know me know that about me. And I do this work for reasons other than feeling hopeful about the future. But there has been no other time in my life that I have felt more hopeful than I do now. When we see that in a single month, the world can stop using petroleum at a rate of 85% less than it was just the month before, we know, we have facts in front of us that we can collectively make change at an accelerated timeline that is tangible, it's provable, we've already done it. We've already practiced how to do it. We know we are designed as human beings to be in loving connection. We are designed as human beings to adapt to what is in front of us. We as a Jewish people are designed to survive as are so many other people who have survived horrific generations of exploitation and genocide as well. And so now is the moment that we organize ourselves well. I urge you to join us. If you're interested, we could talk about this topic for days and days. Thank you yeah. again for having me and Ben the Ark and Amika, I'll turn it back over to you. Stash, you are incredible as always. This is a really painful night to talk about these painful and hopeful moments. Um, Ben the Ark and Lab Shul have partnered before. We will partner again, um, participating with you at the Sela, um, convening earlier this year with a real focus on Jews of color and inclusivity has moved me and us yeah. to move ourselves further and deeper and lean harder. And we have so much work ahead of us. I just got to note that uh, in Union Square right now, there's a police car on fire. Mm -hmm. There is, uh, this is a big night. So for us to come together, we are ready for this moment as Jews, as activists, yeah. as queers, yeah. as people who weren't always white and are now considered white and people who remember on this 51st night since Passover, what it's like to leave Egypt and fight for justice. So you are bending the arc big time. And it's such an honor to have you with us. We're gonna continue this work together after tonight yes. and uh, keep on collaborating. I wanna leave us with the powerful video that uh, Ben VR created about us rising together. And um, after that, we will thank you officially, but I'm really grateful to you, yeah. dear, dear beloved, for helping us breathe at this difficult moment yeah. and commit yeah. to the deepest work and the long, 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 long arc of change that's ahead of us. Yes. Amen. Blessed be. Thank you, team. Thank you. Let's show this video and may this be a night of growth and peace. However, it goes. we are Jewish Americans. We believe in a future for this country where everyone is free and safe, no matter what we look like or where we come from. We are Jewish Americans, as diverse as this country itself. We are one people, but have many experiences and identities. Our people have survived genocide and fascism, deportation and slavery. Resistance and survival are our birthright. We are rooted in a legacy of pursuing justice, and we are rising up again. Because the stakes for this election could not be higher. As we mourn the lives lost in Pittsburgh, Poway, El Paso, and in detention centers 
we know who is to blame. Those who track hate say there is no doubt political rhetoric is in part to blame. President Trump repeating a comment about Jewish Americans. Any Jewish person who votes Democratic is being, quote, disloyal. U.S. Representative Steve King retweeting messages from a known Nazi sympathizer. Charlottesville was a turning point. The president's lack of a complete condemnation of what happened was cheered by white nationalists. By setting the stage for white nationalist violence, Trump and the Republican Party represent the greatest threat to Jews in this country. When it comes to white supremacists and neo-Nazis marching in the street, there is only one side. We know, as a Jewish community, our safety is dependent on the safety of all people. In 2020, Ben the Ark Jewish Action is mobilizing Jews and allies across the country to remove white nationalists from office. We were made for this moment. We won't let politicians harm our communities to expand their own wealth and power. We're going to hold those politicians accountable in November. A more just America is possible, and we will build it together in solidarity. I'm an American Jew, and I'm rising up for a future in which we are all free and safe. I'm rising for LGBT equality. For working class people. For a thriving planet for progress. We are ready. We rise as one. So thank you so much, Sash. Uh, it is a pleasure to hear you and Rabbi Amchai speak just now and reminding us that we who believe in freedom will not rest and that the moral arc of the universe is long, but that it bends towards justice. So thank you, Ben the Ark, for being an amazing partner and the idea of partnering again with you um, fills us with a lot of joy. Um, I was out last night in the protests here in Brooklyn at Barclays Center, and I'm going to say that being in the streets and furthering the work that we as Jews um, are really, I think, um, you know, as it says in the Talmud, it is not ours to complete the work, but neither is it for us to abandon it. That's my, my, my paraphrasing. Um, so it's really important for us to remember that the, the work that's laid ahead of us by organizations like Ben the Ark, a wonderful partner, um, we are all indebted to that together at this difficult time and beyond. Um, so thank you, Stosh, and that video was incredible. So I, I just have to say that I am more than excited, uh, you can see it all over my face, to welcome back uh, Sarah Sakalik, the Executive Director of LabSchool, who you met earlier this evening, and founding member and tuxedoed penguin, uh, <laughs> John Adam Ross, beloved by all of us, uh, also known as JAR, so herein will be uh, named, uh, be called JAR through this broadcast. Um, JAR is an artist, a writer, um, is someone who uh, at the very beginning of our work together before we became Lab Shul Storytelling, where Mavening was our, our primary directive, where we told those old stories from the scroll out on the stage uh, or on the bima, um, just in the way that the priests of yore would have done. And uh, through the leadership of Sarah Sakalik, we've grown as, um, as a shoal. And we've taken this artist-driven mission and we've expanded to become this community that you know today. So I'm excited to have you on camera with me, folks. Melissa, Thanks, I'll folks. just jump in. I'll just jump in to say, I love when you quote the Talmud and I love when you maven the Talmud. That, that was just, I hope that was recorded and that's gonna be used for something else. Jar, take it away. Oh, it's brilliant, just brilliant. I love it. And Melissa, you are my maven. And one of my other mavens, I gotta say in this moment that coming out of what Stash and, and Rabbi Amihai were talking about, um, uh, I am always looking, I'm constantly looking for the voices that help me find understanding and the voices who contextualize justice through art. And one of those voices in my life over the past few years has been Caroline Rothstein, who is a poet and a journalist 
uh, and uh, a creator and a performer. And you can read her in every magazine and you can see her online and all of her poetry and she tours. She's phenomenal. And she is a mem she is a, a, of our community. She is our community. And every time I'm at a Lab Show event and Caroline stands up to speak, I know I'm going to be moved and I know her voice is going to articulate justice. And I'm really excited right now to get to present some of her poetry uh, to this to this incredible gathering. Jar, may I just add before we go to Caroline Rothstein's video, today is Caroline Rothstein's birthday. That's right, it is. I forgot. I knew that. Happy birthday, Caroline. Happy birthday, Caroline. Hi, everyone. A huge thank you to Labshul for having me as part of this unbelievable and incredible reveal-a-thon. I am an artist. I've been an artist my entire life. And sometimes I want to make art so much that it hurts. So it's an honor to be part of an artist-driven community that recognizes the role art plays in our society, in this world, in our collective revealing and healing. I, as an artist, feel so incredibly seen, and I hope you out there are feeling seen too. I wrote this poem a month ago, and I'm reading it now on a week that yet another unarmed black man was murdered by police to think that the stories that could be included in the piece I'm about to share are beyond what they were when I first wrote this piece is heartbreaking. This is called Because This Is America and it starts with a quote from someone's tweet on March 15th. March 14th. Quote, I just went to a crowded Red Robin and I'm 30. It was delicious. And I took my sweet time eating my meal. Because this is America. And I'll do what I want. Katie Williams, 5.16 p.m. March 14th. 2020. Because this is America, where the 4.4 unemployment rate is on the rise. Because this is America, where 2.3 million people are incarcerated, where we have 21% of the prison population worldwide, where one in three black men is incarcerated, where one in six Latinx men are incarcerated, where one in 17 white men this is America, where George Zimmerman was acquitted for the death of Trayvon Martin, where Geronimo Yanez was acquitted for the death of Philando Castile, where Daniel Pantaleo was not indicted for the death of Eric Garner and Sandra Bland is dead, and Tamir Rice is dead, and Alton Sterling is dead, and Walter Scott is dead, and Freddie Gray is dead and Michael Brown's body lay for four hours in the middle of the street because this is America, where someone is sexually assaulted every 73 seconds, and there are roughly 130 suicides per day, and queer youth are five times more likely to have attempted suicide than their straight peers because this is America, where 30 million people suffer from an eating disorder, from which every 62 minutes, at least one person dies, America, where the weight loss industry is worth $72 billion and one in 10 households are food insecure and at least half a million people experience homelessness on a given night because this is America, where one in six children live in poverty, where one in three indigenous children live in poverty, where the average income for indigenous households is 60% of the average income for white households nationwide because this is America. Where Audre Lorde said, 
The master's tools will never dismantle the master's house. So Asada Shakur, so Grace Lee Boggs, so James Baldwin, Emma Goldman, Martha P. Howard, Josephine Mandeman, for the water, for the body, for the band, for the land. Oh, beautiful for spacious skies, for amber waves of gray. In America, where Mount Katahdin reaches 5,267 feet into the sky, where the Pacific Ocean tumbles against the cliffs, where the Everglades are over 700,000 acres of squamp for Purple Mountain's majesty. And the Snake River kisses the Grand Tetons like the clouds envelop the sky. Above the fruited plains. And the sun sets through delicate arch. And the earth whispers silent and still, America. God shed his grace on thee. Because Orlando, Las Vegas, Charleston, Pittsburgh, Virginia Tech, and crown my good with brotherhood. For Parkland, El Paso, Sandy Hook, because Columbine is now the 14th deadliest mass shooting on the list because a crowded red robin because delicious because sweet time because eating because my meal because this is america and i'll do what i want from sea to shining sea. Thank you. Hi, right. everyone. A huge thank you to Lab School for having me as part of this unbelievable and incredible revealathon. I am an artist. I've been an artist my entire life. And sometimes I want to make art so much that it hurts. So it's an honor to be part of an artist-driven community that recognizes the role art plays in our society, in this world, in our feeling. I, as an artist, feel so incredibly seen. You out there are feeling I wrote this poem a month ago, and as it comes. murdered as the chill of November to think back like a the stories that got included in the piece I'm about to share. But I keep seeing you tumbling beyond over and over the blue. They were when I first wrote this piece. And I know I was so small made the ready. You want a fundraising? Hey oh. Lee? So, Hi, we're back. How you doing? Carol Caroline, Caroline Rothstein just gave an unbelievable performance and I just want to remind everyone, say their names. As Caroline just enumerated the names of the people that we are losing to white supremacy and the fact that Caroline just stated that she has been an artist her entire life and that we as a community of artists must pick up this fight now, John and Sarah are going to talk about the importance of the work that we're doing here tonight. Thank you, Melissa. Um, it's it's uh, the tenor of the evening has gone from celebration to to, to tough, um, and we're kind of kind of stay in this in this mode of um, leaning into what's difficult right now. And right now, uh, in this COVID nineteen moment, what is difficult is that um, there are people struggling and people suffering. And while we as LabShul believe that we are on the front lines of spiritual care, um, we, are, um, we, we are privileged to be uh, benefit of, of basic comforts that others don't have. 
Um, so there are um, folks that are struggling and um, we've partnered with two uh, other organizations who are doing amazing work around COVID-19 relief. Um, and so in addition to Lab Shul's Thriving Artist Fund, which is um, raising money to support the gig economy artists that we hire all the time, Caroline being one of them, uh, and many, many others, including Jar and Melissa and, and others uh, like us who have gr grown up in the storytelling world and new newcomers that have come. Um, so the funds that are being raised are to support those artists to keep fueling our work and our souls. Um, we're also uh, raising money this evening for the, the First Responders Children's Fund, which helps children who have lost parents on the front lines and in the lines of duty, um, who are enduring significant hardships and challenges during these difficult circumstances. It's a, it's a fund that began after 9-11, and they've completely pivoted their work now um, to help hospital workers and essential workers and their families um, that are struggling. The third fund that we're raising for tonight is the National Day Labor Organizing Network's Immigrant Worker Safety Net Fund. And this provides immediate resources and financial support to excluded workers who are not benefiting from the, the federal CARES program and other programs like that, who can, can barely take care of themselves and their families. They're traveling from city to city, state to state, doing day labor work, um, whether it's in farms, uh, in construction, just really struggling to get by day to day. So uh, the funds we're raising are for those three particular focuses. Um, and we feel really privileged to work with these organizations. Um, and so I just wanna say, I do, I'm the one doing the tallying behind the scenes of the funds that are coming in. Our last count was we were up just above $17,000, headed to $50,000 to our peak of our mountain. And um, those, uh, there are about uh, 150 some odd donors that got us there. And I know that we've had over 800 registrants to this, uh, to this evening. And I know that some of you are watching with multiple people at home or you're hosting watch parties. So um, it, sometimes it doesn't seem like your $5, your $1 is going to help. It does. Every, I've watched every little bit ha count over the last few days as the, the mountain, the climbing of the mountain has risen. Um, and so, you know, we can, we can accept donations via our donate page, www.labshul.org backslash donate, uh, through Venmo at Labshul, through PayPal, which is our Storytelling Inc. We were talking about storytelling earlier. Those were from our earlier days. Um, and, and of course, a check. Um, is fine and um, you don't even have to get off the couch. I know you have your phones there. Your phones are right there. And if you've been moved by any of our programming tonight, I'll ask you, uh, uh, what Melissa, is, what is that? What? This is my phone and I just wanna say, I just got so inspired that live on the air, I just put at Labshul into Venmo and I am in front of all of us as a community, as one of your hosts. I'm gonna donate $118. Oh, Melissa. Right now, in this moment, to get us to the top of the mountain. We're inspired Amazing. right now by the holiday of Shavuot. Amazing. The fact that this is 24 hours is a nod to the holiday that just passed. And the idea of being on the top of the mountain and, 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 get, and receiving the word. And the word that was just received to me or that I just received from you, Sarah Sokolik, is that it's time to donate. And so although I'm on staff much of the time and I benefit from the money that comes into Lab Shul, I wanna give back. So I am gonna donate $118 in front of everyone right now. Here I go, somebody tell me, oh, it's asking for an emoji. I'm gonna go ahead and <laughs> put the prayer emoji in. Uh, here's my prayer emoji, everyone, and I'm hitting Hey, Lab Shul, $118 right here from my Venmo. It's loading and it's sent. That's amen, amen. Melissa, and thank I you. What I needed to do tonight to feel like I'm part of what we do at Lab Shul. So what do I get? I want to. I want to. I want to say thank you, and I want to take this moment of gratitude. Um, ho hold that thought on what you get. I want to just say this moment of gratitude. Um, I our our tech crew, and I just want to say. 
Folks, we're using a technology that was invented six days ago. As Zoom continues to change, and as all of the live feeds that are becoming more and more available with Zoom, um, our tech team has been working for 48 hours straight um, to make all of this happen. You might have seen a little scroller at the bottom, and we do have a scroller um, which is listing all of our sponsors for this evening. We had a number of, of our uh, generous donors who have underwritten this program ahead of time. And so I know that the tech team, tech team is working on getting that scroller along the bottom. If you see that, um, you know who you are out there. I know that you're watching. Thank you for supporting us. And thank you for every person who is contributing like Melissa just modeled. And you model, by the way, Melissa, so many wonderful things in terms of being a, an amazing human being on this earth. And I learned from you all the time. But you just modeled how to donate to LabShul and to these other funds so beautifully. Um, do we want to pause? I'm just going to take a tech, a tech question. Do we want to pause and show one of our videos right now about one of our charities? Or do we want to talk about our exciting raffle that's coming up? Marika, I'm going to wait for you to talk into my ear, and then we can decide what we want to do. We've got two choices. Here we go. Fantastic. So, Jar, I'm going to hand it over to you to, to talk about our raffle, and then we'll go to those videos. Sounds great. I, I got to tell you, I'm so inspired by you, Melissa. And if you out there uh, give in the next hour, uh, we're going to pick two winners over the next hour. One of you is going to get Morning Altars, this beautiful, stunning seven-step practice to nourish your spirit through nature, art, and ritual. You know, Day Shilkrit was just talking about, and, and Sarah and Melissa, you both spoke about this, uh, and Stash did too. The moment we are in, in this very specific moment, Day talked about how right now where he is, it is storming in British Columbia. There's a storm. Outside our windows, there's a storm. In our homes, there's a storm. In our souls, there's a storm. In our country, there's a storm right now. And that storm will, God willing, pass. God optional willing, pass. But, but we are not allowed to let someone else do the work. Melissa, you said it earlier. We're obligated to do the work. And some of that work is putting beauty into the world. And our artists do that work. And your money helps to support those artists and help to support the communities that are really suffering in this storm. And so this is one of the things that you can get from Day Shilkrit, this beautiful Morning Alters book. Another thing that you can get by Jessica Tamar Deutsch. And Sarah's holding it up. And this incredible illustrated Pirkei Avo, the wisdom of our ancestors. And it is illustrated in this, it is just stunning, y'all. It's a graphic novel um, uh, uh, and, and Jessica's uh, incredible artistry uh, can be yours if you donate in the next hour. In the next hour, and I'm the one that does see all the tickers of when everything comes in. And so we're gonna be on the up and up. Don't you worry, we've got all of the, the timestamps. Um, Wonderful. This is exciting. Ah! Okay. I'm excited. I might I'm excited. We're doing a raffle on the, on the TV, on the air. Okay. We're like, I feel like we're PBS and it's like, if we could only, if we could only be I that think good. We're like WNYC, Sarah. I mean, do I get to be Brian Lair or what? Uh, yeah, it was like, for me, it was like the channel 13, right? It, for, it was like, that was me growing up. Anyway, okay, okay, we could go on forever about a million things, but I think we need to go to these videos. And so um, Marika, tech team, take it away.